Thank you, Diane. Um, it's very exciting to be here. Um, I, I'm a bit suspicious when I saw that the day started at 8.45. Uh, I thought they're trying to kill us indirectly, to be quite honest. <laughs> so it's good to see so many of you have survived. Um, it's not a time for, for disabled people. But what they've done, they've put me after lunch, which is the gra graveyard shift. So that's uh, very refreshing. I'm going to be... People have their specialities with this topic, with bioethics and disability. Mine, on the whole, is assisted suicide. I will talk about other topics as well. Um, I'm not giving you facts and figures. I'm giving you more of a rallying cry, OK? Um, I will try and be funny. But when they said, try and bring some levity and comedy to bioethics, <laughs> I'm not bad at comedy, but I don't know that I'm that good. But I'll try. I will try. Look, Diane mentioned it. I'm going to put up a picture of the last time that I was in Washington. Does that work? I'm not very technical. I like that. There we go. So there's me and another disability activist from the UK called John Smith. We have our bright orange tabards. I have a headband like John McEnroe and sweatbands around my wrists and shorts over my jeans. We're in front of your Capitol building. I was here in April, as, as um, we just heard, April 2008, joining ADAPT. Um, that was, wow, you know, six years ago. Never again, or never before, had I seen so many disabled activists together. 500 odd people, wheeling, single file, almost militaristic. You would never get that in England, never. We would never do that. We're not doing that, no. It was awesome to see, as you would say over here. People were on ventilators, people were on feeding tubes, people couldn't communicate through speech but had their ways, still fighting for the right, uh, their opportunity to live within their own homes, to stay alive. So six years later, and I'm back in Washington, thanks to you guys, I really appreciate you inviting me here. This time, there's no headband, there's no placard, but I think that there's greater urgency. I think that I'm here to join you all in fighting for our right to exist. As an actor, I am an actor, we'll talk about that in a minute, I do have a tendency to be a bit of a drama queen, absolutely, a bit melodramatic, but I actually don't think I am being overdramatic when I say that I fear disabled people are an endangered species. I believe that disabled people are at risk of extinction. I mean, before we're even born, you think about it. We're going to hear about this tomorrow, too. We're being screened out, unselected and labelled as not designer enough to exist. Certain impairments have already been sieved out of the gene pool. Once born, our lives may be shortened by inadequate health care, by do not resuscitate orders being placed on us against our will, by basic treatment and nutrition being non-consensually withdrawn, or by professionals and relatives making misguided decisions about the quality of our lives. And then, if we make it past all of that, if we're lucky enough to have survived, we have the very real fear of being prematurely shuffled off this mortal coil, thanks to a heady mix of mercy killings, acts of compassion, acts of violence, hatred, neglect, euthanasia, and assisted suicide. Disabled people are an endangered species. And I will put a cartoon up. There was a cartoon by a UK uh, disabled activist called Crippin. And it has there a, a, a museum and there's disabled people on a, a plateau, on a plinth. On one side, there's the dodo who's extinct. And on the other side, there's disabled people, blind person, wheelchair user. And the person who's there at the museum says, wow, it says that they died out around 2014. It's entirely possible. Already I have disabled friends, we all have disabled friends, I think. Some of us in this room, wonderful, creative, loving, incredible people who would not be born today. We are a dying breed. Perhaps one day there will be TV documentaries with anthropologists introducing viewers to a world where those who had different minds and bodies were once allowed to roam the earth. Museum tour guides, as you see here, will usher school groups through exhibits of the lesser-known disabled people at the Smithsonian. So how do we stop the extinction of disabled people? That's what I want to talk to you about in the next 20 minutes. 
Being here today is a massive start. Becoming informed about what's actually happening, learning, developing our strategies together within our community before we head out into that big old hostile world beyond the Marriott, ready to continue our fight. So I think we need to let's get angry, let's get passionate here today together. What's exciting as I look around the room, I see such wisdom and experience. And that's the thing, we're all coming at this from very different, these life and death issues, from very different perspectives. You see this morning, we've got Diane, her immense knowledge and experience, Marilyn Sharpness, her legal knowledge, her policy savvy. So what do I bring? Well, I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going to talk about myself. That's what I like to do. So it's true. Yes, yes. I'm a comedian. I'm a broadcaster. I'm an actor. I work with Not Dead Yet. And needless to say, my politics and my passions impact on my work. So, for example, this is absolutely true. I'm currently writing Assisted Suicide, the musical. There we go. On the slide, on the PowerPoint, we have an actress, a blind actress, actually, for what it's worth, in a sling, one of those hoists. Because, oh my God, don't the media love us in hoists? When they're looking at reducing our life, they always have us semi-naked in a hoist, right? So as the opening number, I have a disabled woman come out with her dancing carers in a hoist. Now, if I can get this to play, I apologize for the bad quality. This was just a bit of a kind of workshop where we did this, but I'd really hope... Oh, hold on, I'll go back. Now, why is that not working? That, we, we get to that in a minute. Um, it should be moving. should have been a piece of film. And what happens is she's obviously very depressed, incredibly depressed, and then she goes out into the disco Donna Summer tune, really, basically, and goes, it's a great day to die, 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 die. And a carer's or personal assistance, they spin her around and away she goes. And I believe that this kind of... I, I, I did it because I am fed up. I was being hoisted. The classical music plays in the background and a narrator with a very sad and solemn voice tells the audience how awful our lives actually is. Uh, what's the new term? I've seen people banding it about on Facebook. Expiration porn, apparently, right? I love that phrase. I love that phrase. Objectifying us for the titillation of the observer, making the viewer feel better about their life, because at least they're not us. Perpetuating that view that people like me, people like us, would be better off dead, I wrote the musical because I thought that a witty show tune will do more to counter the view as any op-ed sometimes, yeah? So that's why I do what I do. Diane also said that I was very involved in a, in a thing called the Ouch Disability Podcast. So that's when I got into broadcasting, and that led to something else. And in 2012 and 13, I couple that experience with my belief that assisted suicide, when it's discussed in the media, and that's both here and in the UK, is usually totally biased um, on the perspective, from the perspective of those who are pro-assisted suicide. So I got the, the support to make a two-part world service radio documentary for the BBC based on all the countries that have assisted suicide or euthanasia. I wanted to call it, you saw my picture there, preemptive, euthanasia road trip. The BBC lawyers 
made me euphemistically call it when assisted death is legal. <laughs> Marilyn was talking about the euphemisms we have to use, and that was one. Uh, there's a picture on PowerPoint of me looking a little bit scared, over dramatic again, with a handwritten uh, T-shirt, thanks to Joe, my partner for that, euthanasia road trip. And the blue horrific building behind it with corrugated iron is actually Dignitas in Switzerland. And it does have a couple of steps into it. It used to have a whole flight of steps. It now only has two. So we're making progress. <laughs> Just a little something about the five countries that I visited. I did come out to Oregon, which is where I met some of you wonderful people, uh, where I was wined and dined by Compassion and Choice and tried to convince me that disabled people are not at risk from their laws. No, uh, I didn't fall for that, don't worry. Um, I then went to the little known Luxembourg, where they fed us on the cutest sandwiches. Food figures very highly in the documentary. Um, cutest sandwiches. And the legislators then went on to admit they were a bit disappointed with their law because it was only for terminally ill people. And they said, really, we wanted to include people with dementia and children, but we knew that the legislators wouldn't vote for that. So we came in with a soft bill, and once it's in, we can extend. They admitted it. We have that on the record. It's incredible. Same thing happened in the Netherlands, same thing happened in Belgium, that people admitted to that. Um, but that's their ultimate aim. In Belgium, they've pretty much cut out the middleman and they just go for euthanasia. There's no physician assisted. They just go for physician doing it with the injection. Um, and as you're going to hear later, in recent months, they've extended the law to children of any age. Uh, and we have cases of deaf people who are having problems with their sight. Deaf twins is one of the controversial cases in the last year going and being euthanized. Um, a trans person who had botched surgery going. Uh, dreadful, dreadful. When people say that there is no extension or incremental cre uh, creep or slippery slope, whatever we call it, absolute rubbish when you look at the other countries. Um, of course, we then have Switzerland, where I visited more death clinics than anybody should visit in their life. Uh, there was a chairlift into one of them, and that broke, which was unfortunate. Um, the, I ended up giving decorating tips at another one. I'm not joking. I went to what was called a boutique death clinic. That means it was just small. Um, and there were steps into the bathroom that you use before you're killed. This, this is true. This is amazing. It's amazing. And I'm eating cake with these people. Because they're lovely. That's the problem. They're really lovely. And they want to convince you it's all fine. But I didn't have a drink because I was a little bit scared what would happen if I did. <laughs> Never did. Of course, Switzerland is the great place where they have death tourism, which is where, wherever you're from in the world, you can go and you can be assisted to die. So that's when the ubiquitous Dignitas Clinic, as we see there. Finally, I went to the Netherlands, where practically everything is legal. They have radio ads advertising the joys of euthanasia. Uh, in the documentary, which I'm going to give you all information after the conference about, um, and the transcript of it, uh, there is a great ad with a young girl going, so at the weekend, my dad, my granddad died because of euthanasia. Now, you might think that's morbid, but he had a great death. You should try it. That's on public radio. It's quite incredible. Um, and the thing that there, the hot topic there at the moment is something called completed life which is where when people get to 70 plus, they start to look at having a, a, a pill or whatever to end their life. You don't have to be terminally ill or any progressive condition. You just are tired of life. So that's the one we have to be watching out for. So there you go. The documentary, do have a listen. I am proud of it. It's more balanced than I'd like it to be because the BBC got a bit stupid about it. And whilst we're allowed to have so much pro-assisted suicide stuff out there, as soon as you start to put a different viewpoint, they get very, very, you know, very rule-obsessed. Um, but it did change people, and for that, I'm very much proud. In the UK, at the moment, I'm now known, <laughs> sorry, it makes me giggle, for my role as forensic scientist Clarissa Mullery in the BBC primetime drama Silent Witness. It's like an English version of CSI. So on the PowerPoint, you've got a picture of me with an incredible wig 
looking like somebody from Dynasty years ago, um, and looking a bit serious in uh, kind of a black and white lighting. Uh, when I was offered the role, I said that the only clause I had, because I was thrilled to be in this prime time drama, the only thing I said is if they're ever going to get rid of my character, make sure it's not in an assisted suicide storyline. Oh. It's true, because you just know they'd be thinking, oh, what we, can we do with her? Brilliant. <laughs> now, <clears throat> sometimes... Complete strangers now, because I've been on TV and I'm on, on, I've just done two years of it. So I'm known now. Not over here, you can't get it, you can't get it on Netflix before you ask. Um, sometimes strangers stop me on the street and they ask me if I'm that woman off the TV. And so last month I was having a, a lunch with friends in a, in a station near where I live. And this guy comes up to me. And um, I, to be honest, I totally assumed that he was going to ask me about Silent Witness, because people do. It's just been on the TV. They want to say, oh, you're from telly, or can I have an autograph? And it's very sweet and very weird, to be honest, because um, I never thought that would be my life. But this guy said to me, he said, are you Liz Carr? Now, people don't normally know your name. They know you're that person from the telly. So he was a bit different. He said, when you on Newsnight a few years ago, talking about assisted suicide. OK, so now he had my attention. He knew my name. He knew that I'd been on telly talking about the subject that I'm passionate about. He introduced himself as a retired ethics professor. He'd watched the program. I heard the, oh, I heard it in the room. And he said that he had recorded the clip, and he'd been using it for years in his ethics classes. So like you, I'm thinking, um. And he said, you've changed a lot of people's minds. He said, students have written essays about you and what you said. And he reminded me that during the interview, because I was giving a very strong opposition, and we will see it in a sec, he said, you said that you think you'll be the most hated woman in the UK for your views. And he said, you weren't the most hated person at all. Many people were glad for what you said. Of course, he left, and my friend just looked at me and goes, wow, so you've got ethics. Thanks for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's all he could manage to say. I love it. But this man, I, I've been stopped before. I've had wonderful things happen to me in my life. But I cannot tell you impact and it really was only last month I know often people go this has just happened to me it's just happened to me and it was the perfect timing because I wanted to share it with you because the work that you all do I hope that one day somebody stops you in the street and goes do you know what that thing that you maybe were terrified about or you weren't sure about or you thought oh god I've got to say everything in this one second clip I've got to make sure I get all these points because if I don't then we're all going to die <laughs> or it's down to me because we've got 45 minutes that are pro-assisted suicide and 30 seconds against, and I've got to get my community's voice out there. The weight of responsibility we all feel, yeah? yeah? Absolutely. So I hate doing it, but then somebody says something like that. So what I want to say to you is we don't know the impact that all that shit that we do and the good stuff that we do, how much that touches people. We really don't, because we don't get thanked for it, and we don't know the lives that it's changed. Because I had no idea. And maybe there are other ethics professors, and maybe they teach it in a totally different way. Because as he was leaving, he did say, he said, uh, my, brother, uh, my, my brother's paralyzed. And then, and, there, and then it all clicked in. I thought, aha, an ethics professor with a different slant on things, because he has the direct experience. So vital. Um, people in this room, you have far more. So I'm using that one experience the stuff that you have done in here last year, you know, when we were watching the last election, we were watching the states to, and the, the hope that Obama got in again. That's not what I was worried about. I was worried that would question two go through, yeah, in, in um, Massachusetts, the death with dignity. I wanted to know. That's what was on my mind. And you, you did it. I know there'll be more fights coming up there. Connecticut, you've just, had, you've just saved it again. And I know you'll have to fight it off again. There's people who've done amazing things. So I hope that one day you get those, those comments that I got. Um, 
when the ethics professor approached me, the interview that he remembered concerned the assisted suicide of a 23-year-old disabled man in the UK called Daniel James. Now, if you've not heard of him, you've got your own cases very similar. He was a, a guy who was paralyzed from the neck down after a rugby, American football, um, accident. I know they're different. Um, he hated being what he called a second-class citizen, hated it. Within 12 months of the accident, he begged his parents to take him to dignity, Dignitas to die. And with 18 months, he was dead. Incredible. The press and the public saw the act as tragic, but totally understandable in the situation. His parents were lauded as tragic but brave heroes for taking their son. So in the interview, and I hope it's going to play, if not, we're going to have to just hear the audio, but it's an interview and I want you to hear it because it's not the perfect interview at all. We're going to have some advocacy and media training later, thank God, because I could learn from that too. It's not brilliant, but just to see what, what I said that made a difference. So I go head to head in the clip you're about to see or hear with the former poster girl for assisted suicide in the UK, a woman called Debbie Purdy, my arch nemesis in these debates. And she was worried that her husband would be arrested if he assisted her to go to Switzerland. So, let's hope. No, it doesn't want to do it, does it? Oh, really? Can we hear that okay? Be higher that at all, I wonder. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, I got the last word. Um, always important, whatever it is. Uh, I'm sorry that you didn't get to see it, because one thing you would see is that she was on the screen, and so she was massive, and there's little me uh, in the, in, live there in the studio, and she looks much healthier than I do, which I think is always quite helpful. Always quite helpful. Use what you've got. The fact that those of you that want to live don't look that well, and those of you that want to die look perfectly well, really. You know, just like non-disabled people sitting down, and that's what she looks like. I think that's my strongest thing, the strongest thing. Um, a couple of us giggled. I'm sorry, because it is hard to... Hopefully you were seeing it as well. Um, but one of the things... I, I've used this clip before, not to go, this is an incredible interview. It isn't. But she says... This has nothing to do with disability. This has nothing to do with disability. We will talk about that. Marilyn's been talking about that. I want to talk about that before I go in a minute. Um, the point is, though, why that made a difference is just the fact I was putting up an alternative view. And that's what this encounter with the ethicist has done for me. It's made me realize that can be enough. We don't have to get all the arguments right and in there. Just the fact that there was somebody in opposition who said, not in my name, for a start. Somebody that was breaking the spell. It is a spell, I think, that people think that surely every compassionate, rational, liberal human being would support another person to die in a way of their choosing. I broke that spell. I dared to question how Daniel James's problem was being interpreted and the solution. Just doing that and getting the last word and looking frailer than her, that's all it took. That's all it took. Because, you know, the fact is, when the, wheel, when the, the assisted suicide celebrities, and if you have them over here, they are usually, um, they, you know, they're wheeled out. They're usually disabled people, not terminally ill people. Again, Marilyn was saying. They just add to our problems. They make it harder for us to fight against. They do. Because they just perpetuate the worldview that says, our life's shit, of course we want to die. So we have to work harder. That's why we have to work so hard. And there's something that I've learned, and um, a friend, Simon Minty, who's with us today, said, um, oh, you should, and he was kind of in jest, but he said, this is quite useful, is that we were once talking about all of, of the debate and how difficult it is. And I think we don't even have to win. We just have to create reasonable doubt. Because winning is tough. It really is. And changing people's minds is tough. But if we can suggest that maybe it's not all fine, maybe there are some loopholes, maybe the safeguards aren't as strong, people will rethink. And they will start to think, well, maybe we shouldn't yet vote. So reasonable doubt, sometimes it, that's the best we can hope for. Go for that. Go for that. So that's what I've learned. I've also learned, as Marilyn said, use our language. Use the language of assisted suicide and euthanasia. The number of fights I have with that. I even have allies, colleagues. I also have other not dead yet people and activists now using the phrase assisted dying. That's how insidious it is. It's saying, well, we need to use their, their language so people will understand. No, we need to use our language and keep suicide in there because that's what it is. The things also that I, I've learned, we should not talk about two things. And this is not personal. And this is not meant to be hurtful to anyone, whatever your beliefs. We should not publicly talk about God or the Holocaust. I wish we could talk about both. Both have absolute value and validity here, not out there. I would never. I went to the Holocaust Museum this week. The tendencies, the desire to make the comparisons of lives not worth living, of the economics of keeping people alive. They're there today. They're very relevant. But as soon as we start using those arguments, people roll their eyes and go, eh, fanatics. Is that the best you've got? It's unfortunate, but I think it's true, if we want to be taken seriously. What I do always talk about, and I did on the interview, is about the economic context of what's happening. What's happening to you in the States? What's happening to us in the bringing, well, in all of these bioethical decisions, and particularly assisted suicide, is the economics, the fight that disabled people are having just to survive, just to live at the moment. 
In the UK, in employment law, there is a term known as constructive dismissal. Now, it refers to when an employee feels that they have no choice but to resign from their job because the conditions they're working in are so bad. So they're not kicked out, but life is so bad. They're being bullied, they're being harassed, they're a burden. They're not being appreciated. How many disabled, ill, or older people feel they have no choice but to resign from life because the conditions they're living in are so bad? With essential health and social care becoming increasingly unavailable, is it any wonder that people are choosing to die? This ridiculous idea of choice. Daniel James chose to end his life because he couldn't bear to live like a second-class citizen. That's not ending your life out of choice. That's ending your life because you have no choice. A disabled friend of mine posted on Facebook, uh, no, not another cat video, um, but I would like to see a cat video about assisted suicide. I think that would be quite good. Um, <laughs> Possibly where the people to make it. But instead it was a call to arms and a campaign against the atrocities, the, the cuts that are happening across. She said, many disabled people have and are facing a complete absence of rights and the government is encouraging this. To what ends, we can only guess. But dead people don't rebel. They cause no fuss and no bad publicity. They don't vote and they don't demand equal rights. This campaign is about you and me ensuring disabled people won't be in horrendous neglect due to cuts. Neglect kills, sometimes more slowly and torturously. Disabled people are being deprived of the right to exist by, by denying us the means to live. And I have um, a picture of Johnny Crescendo, some people will know. This is a protest outside the Parliament in the UK with an activist called Chris Hughes massive poster that says personal assistance not assistance to die the sad thing is that's a picture from 10 years ago we are still fighting and we're going to be fighting for many more years so what i want to do briefly before i go is just a little something about to remind us all and this is why we're here is why disabled people have to be engaged in these debates why we are the best people to be in these debates Number one, dignity is not related to wiping your ass at all. Excuse me for being blunt, but it's true, yeah? Most of us in this room would have no dignity. It's not related to feeding or breathing tubes. It's not related to the ability to communicate verbally. It is not, a, a, none of these things give you dignity. However, the people who were so scared of being us, fear, loss of being a burden, fear of pain, loss of role and identity, no quality of life, dependence, incontinence, sheepskin, Velcro, and hoists, don't they? That's what they fear. That's what they imagine our life is all about. Many people would rather die than be like us. They sometimes even say it to our faces. Oh, if I was you. Oh, I don't know how you cope. I couldn't. I couldn't. They think they're complimenting you. That's the best. They think it's a massive compliment. You do so well. So well. I always think that we are people's greatest fears, disabled people. We are the living embodiment of the fragility of humanity. That's what we are. That's why people are so scared of us. That's why they want to get rid of us. That's why assisted suicide is so easy in many respects. People imagine how awful it is to be us and know that they couldn't survive that. And when I was doing the documentary, I met somebody who said to me, you know, 90 seems old until you're 89. I love that. Yeah, being disabled is all until you're there. And we, even amongst ourselves, we might play that game. You know, what would you rather be, deaf or blind? Okay, it's just me that plays that game. But, you know, <laughs> what would you rather be, incontinent or have no voice? Well, I play that all the time. We still do that. Yeah, it's one of those moral dilemmas. What do we do? So dignity, not related to wiping your ass. There's a picture of a man, actually, Nixon, who had locked-in syndrome. Um, and wanted to die, but wanted a doctor to euthanasia because he couldn't do it himself. Um, in the hoist, there you go. Uh, be, being disabled is not a death sentence, uh, is number two. That's why we should be involved in the debate. 
It's a cartoon that I'll just describe. Some poor language, I'm sorry, I do have a bad mouth. Uh, again, the same cartoonist we saw before. There's a person in a wheelchair, um, they've got a Not Dead Yet campaign uh, thing beside them, and the Grim Reaper is facing them. So, wheelchair user, head on with the Grim Reaper, the wheelchair user says, and you can fuck off. Um, I love that, I love that, of course. Uh, being disabled is absolutely not a death sentence. Those of us who know what it's like to be us, who know that uh, quality of life is not measured by how much you physically do, or your impairment, your thinking, um, it's by normalized definitions of attainment and happiness and achievement and independence. Oh, absolutely, it is not the end of the world, it is just the beginning of a new world. Sometimes difficult, that's the thing. Daniel James was going through a difficult time. Nobody can deny that. We've all felt that. Marilyn Astor's, absolutely. How many of us would not be here if the option to end our life when we became disabled? Or many, many of us in our community. But having 15 days or having the ability to use an assisted suicide law so easily. Fine. Disability and terminal illness are not the same thing. This is a very clever manoeuvre by proponents of assisted suicide. Really clever. Blur those lines. Legislation by confusion, I think of it. Right? Because all the people, Marilyn said this, all the people, my nemesis, that, that's her, uh, Debbie Purdy. As, like I said, she looks fine-ish. Um, she's not disabled, she has MS. She's not terminally ill. She has MS. We have the author Terry Pratchett, who has dementia. I don't know if people are aware of him. Uh, Debbie Purdy, Tony Nicholson, uh, the guy with locked in syndrome. All of those three main poster people for assisted suicide would not qualify for assisted suicide under the legislation. None of them would. So already we're creating this view that it's okay. We've just had in England uh, news of two older women who've been assisted to go to Dignitas in the last three months. An 89-year-old and a 99-year-old woman. The 89-year-old felt that the world alienated her and she couldn't get on with technology. So she wanted the right to go to Dignitas in Switzerland and she was assisted to go and she died. And in many of the newspapers in England, when you read that story and you read the comments afterwards, or you hear the phone-ins, 60, 40, 70, 30 are on the side of that woman. Of course. I don't, I don't want to, I want to keep the glory, people are saying. I don't want to totter to my death. I've had a good innings. Already that what's acceptable is happening. The slippery slope's already happening because it's not about the legislature. It's actually about people and it's about public and the media okay pain doesn't have to be a pain uh, a cartoon there of a, a, a bottle of tablets with assisted suicide and a do not open pain does not have to be a pain we know that that's a thing that's why disabled people bring so much to this debate many of us live in pain we know we know what can be done about it or we have the contacts we have the knowledge that knows that you can still have a, a a valuable life and be in pain. And I'm sure we all know these statistics, but Oregon's 2013 Death with Dignity report indicates that, as in previous years, the three most frequently mentioned end-of-life concerns are loss of autonomy, decreasing ability to participate in activities that made life enjoyable, and loss of dignity. Out of seven reasons, pain comes second to last. Pain's like 20-30%. Most people, it's about being a burden and not being able to do what you used to be able to do. All things about disability. Pain doesn't come up there, and yet pain is used to sell assisted suicide legislation. Independence is a myth. I don't have to talk about that too much. Again, living with an impairment has taught us the truth that independence is not about doing everything for yourself. No man or woman is an island, but instead it's about having the help you need under your control once you know that. But in a climate of economic cuts, Medicare, Medicaid, social care in the UK, that's harder to prove that. Of course, if you lose your independence, you've, people will feel they've lost their sense of self. We understand that, but we understand the economic links. Life can be bloody good and bloody awful. I think we know that. I think we know that when you're a disabled person. 
I think you really do have that. I think you no matter how happy and much you love your life, you know that life has ups and downs. It does on a daily basis. Um, but this increasing desire for assisted suicide and euthanasia legislation seems to be about how having Marion said it so well that one pill, that velvet pillow ending to your life, when in actual fact that isn't what it looks like. Death isn't pretty, life isn't either. And even with assisted suicide, death is not pretty. Doctors aren't gods or goddesses. Jesus, we do know this, don't we? Um, disabled people are most likely to have had more encounters with the medical profession than the majority, I think. So I think we know all too well their fallibility. Many of us may be disabled because of their fallibility and their mistakes. So we know that, I think. So we've lived beyond our prognosis that many doctors gave. We saw that this morning. We also know how doctors can be the gatekeepers of so much. Now, I'm sure that's the same over here. Gatekeepers to housing and resources and wheelchairs and programs and employment. Yeah? Doctors often, that medical, that thing signed by them, so do we want them to be gatekeepers over our lives as well? Do we want to give them that power? I don't. The slide is actually from the NHS. You'll know about the National Health Service. We just about have a National Health Service in the UK. It's moving more to your lovely approach, um, which I know is changing too. Maybe we'll meet in the middle one day. Maybe we'll meet in the middle. So the NHS still just about providing free health care for, for everyone, just about, which is incredible and many of us are alive because of it. But it does have a page on its... I like the irony. The NHS Choice website has a little piece on euthanasia and assisted suicide, um, which is, is quite fab. So doctors are not gods or goddesses. And what I'd like to say about that, doctors are also some of our strongest allies in these campaigns. Um, and in actual fact, re very recently in the UK, and the, we need this, this statistic for us, the Royal College of GPs, of general practitioners, voted against assisted suicide by 77%. Uh, they were concerned that assisted suicide would be detrimental to the doctor-patient relationship, that vulnerable groups in society would be at risk, and that it would be impossible to be sure that every request for assisted dying was entirely voluntary. Doctors, on the whole don't want the responsibility and the power that legalising assisted suicide would give them. Brilliant. Brilliant for those of us campaigning against. We know this, those of us who've been on the uh, fighting there on our direct actions or not, not the problem barriers are. If you can get rid of so much of the rubbish that happens in our lives, you would mean, it would mean that so many disabled people didn't want to end their lives. Yet yeah, that mostly this is about, it can be about barriers. Discussions about life and death issues are usually incredibly individualistic, impairment focused, and overly emotional. That's what the media wants. If it bleeds, it leads, they say. They want the personal stories about how awful our lives are. But those of us that have impairments and disabled people know that on the whole, it is the barriers that disable us. And that's important. That's why it's important that we are involved in these debates. And finally, Choice is bullshit. I kind of wish it wasn't, but it isn't. When I was making a documentary on assisted suicide, I asked a few people what choice. I met, asked everybody what choice asked for them. Uh, there was a disabled activist from Oregon, um, Ellie Jenny. And I said, you know, is it important to you that you have choice over how you die? And she said she had so few resources. In fact, as I was there, her wheelchair had broken and she was waiting for the guys to come and mend the chair, but she'd been waiting a week, so she hadn't been out of the house. That was the reality, and I'm there doing this interview. And she said, how can you have choice when you don't have the most basic choices in your life? Her fear being, of course, that choice would become a duty. People already have choice about how they die. Um, what they want, though, well, this is actually just amazing. What they want is to legitimize their choice as the right socially approved choice. That's what they want to do. As activist Michael Bailey said, the issue is not whether you have choice. The issue is whether you have the government involvement in that choice. Absolutely. Lots to think about. Look, before I leave, I have one thing that I'd like to say. Um, it's a little bit of a quick quiz, just to lighten up the heavy shit, yeah? Um, I know, they got me in to do comedy. Who'd have thought? Ah. Um, so, four pictures. Which one of these I want you to think of, and I'll read out who they are. 
Which one of these is the odd one out and why? We have the banner-tailed kangaroo rat, top right. We have the African elephant. We have grey-haired night monkey, which sounds rude. Or we have the person with Down syndrome. Do, 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 do. What do you think? Who's the odd one out? It's the human. It's the human. That's right. The odd one out is the person with Down syndrome because whilst all of them are at threat from extinction, the person with Down syndrome has no protection in law. The animals, however, are all covered by the 1973 Endangered Species Act. There is now a 90% plus termination rate for Down syndrome and spina bifida and other impairments. If you're a rat, a monkey, or an elephant with a 90% plus termination rate, you are on, officially on the endangered species list and receive full legal protection and attention. So I just want to say, to finish, how many more impairments do we need to lose? How many lives have to be extinguished? How many of our community have to disappear before disabled people are afforded legal protection at the beginning, middle, and end of our lives? We've got legislation that discriminates against us, that denies us life, and that, and, and that enshrines in law that disabled people's lives are without value. What we need is legislation that protects us from extinction. So perhaps it's time for the Disabled Persons Endangered Species Act 2014. I've been Liz Carr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I know that we're probably running really late, so I'm going to wait for Marilyn to get up here to know if we've got any time for questions, which we probably don't. But thank you. I'm sorry it wasn't funnier, but you know.